Gaga Bazipin or Oxka Bazipin. Um, I'm sure people would have noticed that I've completely skipped phenytoin there. It's not something I ever use um, in children. Because of the, I know it's, it's something that I think in India we use it a lot, but um, I do use it occasionally having failed with all other drugs, maybe as a last resort. But phenytoin is something we only use in the status where we use phosphenetoin to control the status and then switch over to a longer term anti-epileptic because of the high side effect profile. I'm sure it's been around for several years, so it's probably known much more and that's why we know more of the side effects. The newer ones probably don't know that much about the side effects. And Valproate has been around for 40 years and it's really one of the best drugs for generalized epilepsy. Absence, it's um, Valproate again. Etrosuximide is not available anymore. Lamotrigine again is quite effective and kindly avoid carbon zipping in absence because it's, it's thought to lead to even absence state is sometimes. It actually worsens absence. Next one please. <coughs> so partial epilepsy with or without generalization, I think um, carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine is the first choice usually unless there is a contraindication or unless they develop a drug rash in which case again you go back to good old Valproate. Um, my chronic epilepsy including atonic dro drops you go for Valproate and Leviteristem is again something that I've been using increasingly recently. I think as a gold standard, if in doubt, well do it. Next one, please. Um, newer anti-epileptics, just a quick one. I think uh, Leviteristem is the one that shows great promise, really. It seems to have a very low side effect profile. It seems to be quite effective. And now intravenous preparations are also available. So it does seem to be uh, gaining in popularity everywhere. I think in the states they've started using it uh, in the ICU setting in uh, giving IVs and I think uh, in Apollo Children's Hospital in the PICU also we are using Leviteristem quite often in even the post head injury patients we've been using it. Gabapentin is more for neurogenic pain really not for seizures. Tiangabin again is not available in India. Next one please. These are other things that again, um, vagal nerve stimulation is thought to be quite effective in reducing the number of seizures, especially in intractable seizures. Uh, we used to use it in the UK, but I don't think we've uh, got any patient here that uh, has a vagal nerve stimulator really. Ketogenic diet is something that is quite effective when it's used for a year or two, but after a year or two, it becomes a painful diet to follow. So it's a very difficult diet for the child and for the parents because you know the calories need to come from fat. It's very very difficult for the child to be completely on a fatty diet, and God knows what it does to their cholesterol levels in the long term. <laughs> Thank you. Next one. I think uh, just go to the next. We can just go through briefly a couple of cases and then we can. The cases. <coughs> so I thought if we just go through some of the common presentations that you're likely to see in your clinic walking through your door. Um, this is just the first one that I've got. It's a seven-year-old who came in with a recurring episodes of loss of consciousness, stiffening and jerking, and uh, urinary incontinence during these episodes. That's a classic history of a generalized tonic-clonic seizure with incontinence during the seizure. Um, has had about seven episodes in the last ten months. Previous to that, he had been completely well. There's no other significant family history also or past medical history. Next one, please. So what would you, what would you invest? Can we make this an interactive forum or would you just like me to just go through it? What would you like to do investigations wise? So in this particular, shall I just carry on? Uh, next one, please. 
So I just went on with some routine bloods, did an EEG and neuroimaging. I did an MRI personally in this child. In general, I tend to go for MRIs mainly because it's radiation free and it gives more information. Next one. So that was the EEG of this child. So you can see these. So these are, these are the spike and wave discharges you've got. And it's pretty much generalized. Next one. So this child was commenced on Valproate after discussing with the parents. And uh, a check blood count and liver function test is always organized six weeks after six weeks to eight weeks after Valproate. You would need to do a liver function test to make sure that there's no side effect from the Valproate and the liver enzymes are not going up. So now the, see, uh, the child is completely seizure free on Valproate. He's actually just recently came back for follow up, having been seizure free for two years, and I'm thinking of weaning him off the Valproate. Next one. So, in general, whenever there is a generalized seizure, uh, primary generalized seizure, monotherapy with one medication at appropriate high doses would be the drug of choice, really. Uh, at least two different monotherapies should be tried before putting on a second, adding on a second drug. Uh, and parents need to be counseled properly that, you know, don't stop the medication. Very, it's very often parents come back after two months saying, you only told me to give it for two months, I stopped it for last week, I couldn't come and see you last week. So for one week he's not had any valproate. So you end up having this one week gap and this child who might be fitting. So just make sure you tell the parents that until and unless I tell you, don't stop the medication. Next one. So this is the next one, which is a, quite an interesting one. Eight-year-old boy, he had a history of sudden episodes of staring um, all through the day he would have several episodes where he would just stare into space, stop whatever he was doing and stare into space. But recently, this he had had for several months, recently, last two months, he had had episodes where he was um, having uh, you know, attacks where he was conscious throughout, but he was kind of falling down and doing that, doing this. Um, and the parents were very confused as to what was going on. Next one. So, um, one of these events was actually witnessed in the casualty and he was completely conscious, he was just playing, he was just acting. We could just see him do that. Um, and then uh, after uh, taking a history, it was felt that because of poor learning in the school, he was being teased. So he was using this as an excuse for not going to school. So he was acting out in school and he was being sent back home. So uh, there is no other family history as such. Next one. So this is the child. If you just double click on that, we can just... So this is in my uh, OP where we just uh, made him hyperventilate. So just give it a minute and you will see what happens. <coughs> having like dozens of episodes throughout the day of this what he's going to just do just now. So this is actually a real seizure that he's had just now. The one that we saw in casualty was not like this. He was completely conscious, the one that he had in casualty. This one, he was not at all conscious. He didn't know what was happening. He was just staring into space and he had this mild movement in his arms. The one in the casualty, he actually was completely aware. He was looking at you. If you pinched him, he was reacting to the pain and he was doing that. That's all. All his four limbs, he was just going up and down, thrashing his limbs. So, next slide, please. 
So that was his EEG, which shows a classic three per second spike in wave discharge. So that's just your three per second spike in wave discharge that showed. Especially with hyperventilation, it was quite pronounced. Next one. So we made a diagnosis of a petit mal epilepsy with pseudo seizure overlay. So you know he he was having events, but because of the events, he was missing out on learning. So he was actually acting out as if he was having further generalized seizures. So we decided to treat the petit mal epilepsy. Next slide, please. He was sorry. Uh, he was started on valproate, went seizure free almost immediately. And uh, since then, he's never had the other event. So um, he, he was one of those children who was very well controlled on. Uh, as soon as that's the thing about petit mal, as, lo as soon as you make the diagnosis and you start treatment, their learning improves. They're, they're not missing out on their learning throughout the school. The main problem with petit mal is they, they actually miss what's happening in school. They have several episodes throughout school. And they miss what's happening, and then you know they can't cope with studies. Next, so this one is another which is very very common. Uh, four month old baby, first time they noticed that she started having salam attacks. So the baby would just go like that, and um, in a day would have about uh, four or five clusters each time, ten to twelve salams and uh, would actually be very upset. Throughout the salam attacks, the child would be very upset and screaming. So this is, you know, in a day, easily 40, 45 episodes of myoclonic jerks involving the upper body were noted. Next one. So that's her EEG. I'm sorry, the slide is not very clear. But what it shows is basically polyspike discharges originating from all over the the brain, which is a classic hips arrhythmia. Next one, please. So we diagnosed West syndrome. This child was started on ACTH injections, and pretty much two days later, there were no seizures. Um, doesn't always happen, but this particular child was very responsive to ACTH. Um, the MRI was fine, normal, so there was no pre-existent uh, brain deformity and this is what we call cryptogenic infantile spasms and responded beautifully to treatment and then completely went back to normal which is a very rare case in terms of infantile spasms more often you would find that there is some kind of underlying problem and they do have very long-term developmental problems and uh, developmental delay and the parents need to be counseled that this is a child who's going to need long-term follow-up, is not going to be normal, is probably not going to make it to a normal regular school, probably going to need a special school. Um, and this is something we, we can only predict with time, with response to treatment, how bad it's going to be. Obviously, if the MRI straight away showed a season carefully, or a, a really bad malformation of the brain, then we can listen carefully. We can just straight away tell him, I'm sorry, but this child is never going to be a completely normal child. This child is always going to have special problems. It's going to need to be completely you know, under medical treatment for a long, long time, probably lifelong. And it's one of the, the things that you need to refer. The reason I put up this four-month-old who developed, who was so easily treated is because there are there is that small proportion that if they are present early enough and are treated early enough they do have a normal developmental outcome sometimes at least you know near normal developmental outcome whereas if they carry on having infantile spasms for a few weeks or even months and then they present late their developmental outcome is always abnormal they won't develop normally if we treat them early they, they do a lot better. Is that enough or shall we? I think. Have I finished my time? Um, okay. Um, this is a very interesting one. I think probably a lot of people will find this interesting. This is an eight-year-old child who came with almost daily events. She would have these jerks in her upper limbs. Uh, sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right, 
and they would uh, last for uh, a few minutes and then she would go back to normal. She had been on Malproate for several years. So she, with no effect, in spite of being on Malproate, there was no effect. And 